Hello, my name is Federico Borsari and welcome to CEPA's State of the Alliance, uh, a special series bringing together top leaders from Europe and North America to deliberate on the most pressing challenges facing allies and partners. Today, I am particularly honored and thrilled to welcome the Director General of the European Union's military staff, Lieutenant General Mikhail van der Lan. Lieutenant General, welcome uh, to CEPA. Thank you very much. So we have, uh, um, we are amidst, uh, uh, you know, a very interesting phase uh, uh, in European security, but also if we enlarge the perspective also in, in the neighborhood of the European Union, and we have, we have seen the return of large scale war on the European continent uh, for the first time after Second World War. But we are also uh, facing an increasingly complex security uh, environment across the neighborhood of the European Union. And uh, in this phase, we, are, we know that the European Union is trying to become uh, a more proactive uh, global actor and uh, to, is also trying to build a more, let's say, capable military tool to, do, to deal with uh, um, unexpected crises, for instance, across its neighborhood. So there is a lot uh, to delve into in this discussion. Uh, but uh, let me start with uh, 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 a focus on, on Ukraine. So we are uh, more than two years now into uh, Russia's full-scale invasion uh, of Ukraine. And uh, could you tell uh, uh, us more about what the European Union has done uh, so far to support Ukraine. What do you think are the uh, priorities for the coming months? Well, let me first start by saying that I think the European Union has done a lot, a lot since the war started. So there was unwavering support for Ukraine from the beginning. From the military point of view, we started uh, to support them with training one half year ago with the so-called EU training mission, in which 24 out of 27 member states participate. We have been training in these one and a half years about 55,000 soldiers already on European soil, mainly in Poland, Germany, but also in countries like Spain, Italy, Czech Republic, Lithuania, Latvia, etc. For the next months, we intend to do as much as possible based on the requirements coming from the Ukrainian general staff. So the training is go ongoing. The second thing is that we are doing is we are supporting them with equipment and ammunition. All member states are donating equipment, ammunition or money to buy uh, these things. And until now, we uh, support them with more than 20 billion uh, when you talk about money. Well, that's, that sounds a lot and uh, it's important to, uh, to flag this aspect because, uh, of course, there has been a lot of focus on uh, the support coming from the U.S., but at the same time, it's also worth noting how the European Union and uh, uh, how so many different countries have been able to you know, come together and, and increase and, and, and ramp up their uh, efforts to provide uh, you know, what Ukraine needs to, uh, to win on, on the battlefield. Um, but um, widening a bit uh, our perspective, um, I would say that Russia's uh, brutal aggression uh, uh, against Ukraine um, is part of a broader set of, uh, of security threats that the European Union um, is facing, and especially from across its southern neighborhood, um, where the overlapping of conflicts, poor governance, um, climate change as well, um, and socioeconomic problems is, is fueling, uh, um, uh, you know, a security crisis, uh, which, you know, uh, can be very dangerous for uh, European countries and European Union uh, as well. Uh, how does um, the uh, European Union strategic compass um, address this new threat landscape? How um, um, uh, does the European Union uh, see this, this uh, uh, you know, new uh, uh, threat landscape and what can be done to, uh, you know, to address the problems that are associated with it? Yeah, well, let me first make a last remark on Ukraine because I think it's important to see that the war in Ukraine is a physical direct threat to the European Union. Uh, and that's why Ukraine should and be supported as much as possible in order to win this war. Um, Absolutely. Next to that, when we talk about the defense of the European territory, it's a NATO task. So the EU is part, most EU countries are part of NATO and collective defense is and will always be a NATO task. So we're very glad that we work together with the US and Canada 
and some other non-EU partners at NATO. Now concerning the South, clearly we see that uh, there are some developments uh, that are worrying in the African countries. Um, So we we are more or less pushed out, many uh, Western countries, including US, uh, from Niger, from Mali, uh, from Burkina Faso, from, from other countries. And this will cause problems for the future if we don't act. Because uh, what we will see is a mass migration coming towards Europe. Mm -hmm. Migration is not per se a problem, but what comes with migration is terrorism and criminalism. And that's what we not not can afford uh, to get into the European uh, soil. So we are thinking about an integrated approach to step up our efforts in Africa. Uh, And especially this approach will be that we will uh, support them in a way that they ask for instead of bringing them good, like we did in the past. So we're working hard on that one. But the reality at the moment is we lost ground. We lost ground in Mali, we lost ground in Burkina Faso, in Niger, and some other countries. At the same time, we're doing very well in in Mozambique, in Somalia, Mm -hmm. and we're starting up some new efforts in the Gulf of Guinea. Um, The third threat we are facing is the, um, the sea lines of communication. So the Houthis who are targeting merchant shipping, merchant shipping yes. in the Red Sea and which uh, prevents us using the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. Mm-hmm. And actually at, as we speak, we are shoulder to shoulder operating with two operations. There's an American operation in that area and there's a uh, European naval uh, operation, Aspides, yes. uh, which uh, is um, protecting merchant shipping, very successful uh, until now. If we don't do that, it will cost the European Union 200 to 300 million per day. So there's a clear economic interest also. Oh, that's that's very interesting. And, and uh, thanks for mentioning the Aspides mission, which I think is uh, is crucial and has been um, uh, unprecedented in a way uh, um, on how it has been able to you know bring together countries uh, that have also different, uh, let's say, um, approaches to security uh, and, and interest as well. But at the same time, uh, under the European Union flag, they've been able to uh, to deliver and to deploy uh, in, in, in the Red Sea area and uh, to tackle the, the OD threat. At the same time, um, I think it's interesting also to notice the, uh, uh, the increased penetration of Russia uh, in in Africa, especially, and uh, can you can you comment uh, very briefly on that? What 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 does the European Union uh, uh, think of this of this increasing Russian presence uh, along its southern uh, border? Of course, it's not good. I mean, we see more Wagner presence, we see more uh, Africa core presence, which both is Russian, but we also see more Chinese presence, presence from Iran sure. and some other countries. So there are more more actors active in Africa. Uh, and I mentioned already migration, but uh, it also means that when we are not present there, that it will be more difficult to have access to raw materials. That's also why those other actors uh, are, are, are in place at the moment. Uh, the European Union doesn't like it. Uh, we didn't find the answer yet how to cope with that, because uh, when we talk about training mission, for example, um, we have difficulties with uh, training people uh, realizing that perhaps at the same time, a few weeks after, they will operate together with Wagner. Uh, so that's why we stopped operational training in some uh, countries. Uh, and for the future, um, we need to think about how to make sure that they choose for us instead of for Wagner. Oh, that's a, that's a great uh, that's a great point, and um, uh, of course the, the the increased penetration of uh, of Russia has been uh, you know ongoing uh, for a while now, and and is certainly becoming problematic uh, from a, from a security standpoint, but also for the stability of the of of, of that area uh, and 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 those countries uh, themselves. Uh, but building upon what you just outlined. Um, mm, the European Union is trying to become more proactive, right, in uh, 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 across the globe and, and especially across, uh, 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 along its uh, its borders. Um, uh, and the establishment of the EU uh, rapid deployment uh, capacity, capacity um, which should we should have a projected strength of uh, up to five thousand. Uh, soldiers by uh, 2025 uh, becomes, I think, a very important, uh, you know, uh, tool to deal with this 
this kind of threats and crisis. Uh, could you tell us more about the uh, capabilities that the, this uh, 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 rapid deployment uh, capacity should have uh, to be effective? Mm. Well, of course, it depends on the circumstances and the task that the uh, rapid deployment capacity would get uh, once uh, um, to be deployed. The core of the rapid deployment capacity is the so-called European Battle Group, which uh, consists of about 1,500, 1,500 uh, soldiers, mainly infantry, combat service, combat service support. And the idea is to add modules to that um, uh, based on the requirements. So uh, additional infantry, air uh, assets, perhaps naval assets. Uh, so it's, it should be a flexible force that has a, 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 a high reaction potential. Now that's that's interesting because we have seen also how it's becoming more and more necessary to have a rap rapidly deployable uh, uh, mechanism and, and tool uh, from a military standpoint to deal with the unexpected crisis. Yeah. And uh, certainly there are uh, threats now emerging that will could at least uh, become more more uh, problematic in the coming years, uh, and could threaten interest of, of European countries. So that's that's uh, an important, um, let's say, uh, engagement and commitment that the European Union is doing on on the, on the military level. Um, if if you um, could expand a bit more on some of the challenges that this rapid deployment capacity. Uh, face? What, what do you think uh, are the most uh, relevant one uh, for the European Union? Well, I think the most challenging part will be that we establish a force that is uh, truly interoperable. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are working on ideas how to develop uh, such a rapid deployment capacity, how many countries should be involved or member states, uh, should we work with, fast, uh, with, with fixed groupings or... Uh, so interoperability is a key uh, word. And secondly, strategic enablement. So we need strategic transport, we need intelligence assets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now it's looking good. We're working hard on this, um, and member states will have to make it available because we, we don't own it. Uh, right. But for sure, from the beginning of next year, we will be uh, FOC with a rapid deployment capacity, ready to act. That's that's great. That's great news, and uh, I think it's important to stress this uh, uh, when we discuss, you know, how the European Union is is doing uh, and and working hard to to become more proactive. And um, uh, you've you've already mentioned uh, uh, very very uh, a very important tool, um, uh, but at the same time, we also know that uh, at the present uh, at the present stage. Um, European uh, countries are struggling also to uh, in, increase the investments into the defense sector, even though there has been a lot of a lot of efforts to 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 do that, especially since the uh, since the full scale scale invasion two years ago. Uh, but there are still a lot of challenges when it comes, to, for instance, to industrial capacity uh, and and uh, also the uh, the production of of equipment, and at the same time also uh, finding. Um, uh, you know, a common approach to uh, uh, to defense across Europe. Uh, uh, how is your team working on on these issues? For instance, uh, when it comes to uh, the increase of uh, you know ammunition production, and how do you think uh, European countries uh, uh, can can improve uh, on this on this aspect? No, my team is not per se directly working on this. We are supportive. Uh, as you perhaps know, in the European Union we have the EDA, the European Defence Agency, mm -hmm. and they are responsible and working on uh, enhancing procurement, uh, improving interoperability, uh, international coordination, etc., etc. What we do is we bring forward the requirements. Uh, so requirements concerning um, weapon systems, interoperability, CIS, etc. Okay, uh, how have European countries responded to to the to the requirements? Let's say request of of your, of your team. Have you find have you found uh, difficulties or or more receptive? Uh, you know. No, I think everybody uh, knows that we need to do reactions. something. Uh, we need to, to to improve. We need to be faster, stronger, more interoperable. Uh, but now it comes to words to deeds, and of course uh, to gain something. Every member state needs to have some pain. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so you have you give up something and you gain something you gain something and so it's all about national industry it's about national interests it's about at the end of the day it's about uh, people losing their work or getting more work and uh, so we'll find ways there but but for sure it will not be easy yeah that's 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 very interesting thank you and uh, to um, arrive at the uh, final part of our conversation uh, in one month we will have an historical um, and pivotal uh, summit, uh, NATO summit here in Washington. And, and while complex, it, the EU-NATO cooperation uh, remains a, a key, uh, remains key for, for transatlantic security and stability. Uh, how can the EU best harmonize uh, its uh, uh, cooperation with, with NATO and um, um, how can, you know, uh, avoid uh, friction and duplications of efforts in, in the military realm, according to you? I think the solution is very easy. There is uh, a clear uh, priority uh, concerning collective defense for NATO. European countries and EU countries uh, should procure those things that are identified by the NDPP, the NATO defense planning process, because these shortfalls, uh, once procured, will serve both NATO and the EU. Uh, there's no competition from my point of view. Uh, we will be responsible for um, capacity building operations, uh, for securing, for example, lines of communications, but for collective defense, it will be NATO. It is NATO, it will be NATO for the future also. No, that's, that's, that's perfect. And thanks so much for, for you know, uh, coming to SIPA and for giving us uh, uh, a glimpse of what the European Union is doing in, uh, in the security space and, and, and the military space as well. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining SIPA State of the Alliance series. Please make sure to follow SIPA social media accounts and check out SIPA.org for the latest analysis and upcoming events.